So when I went to college, I became very religious. I didn't believe in God or anything like that. I believed in technology. The kind of technology I believed in was artificial intelligence, AI, the quest to build a machine as smart as we are. Um, I think it's safe to say that I was something of an AI fanatic. That is, I thought this was the most important thing anybody could ever do. Uh, here's how you can become an AI fanatic. The first thing to do is learn some AI programming skills. Natural language processing, probabilistic reasoning, statistical machine learning, these are your tools. Next thing is get challenged to do something really difficult, something that seems really difficult. Maybe handwriting recognition, or summarizing a news story, maybe playing the blues. Then go away for a few days, a few weeks, maybe a few years, and you come back with a system that can complete that task, more or less complete that task. Um, it's an incredibly seductive feeling to be able to do this. It's very powerful. And you think by induction, well, gosh, if I can build machines to solve all these clever tasks, I could build a machine that could solve any task. And that's the holy grail. If you had that, if you had a machine that was as smart as we are, why, it could solve all the problems we can solve and more. It could answer all of our questions. Seems like something worth working on. So I spent about the first decade of my career pursuing that dream uh, in academia, first at MIT, working with great folks like Marvin Minsky, Noam Chomsky, uh, and then out here in Silicon Valley in the dot-com era, um, which was a lot of fun. I had some moderate success there. My algorithms would usually do a more or less good job at uh, doing the small little tasks I'd assigned to them. Uh, my first startup was acquired by Excite, and so there's some business validation of our work. I should have been just on top of the world from this. It's a technologist's dream. But something was really missing, something important. Um, no matter how advanced our technologies became, the problem was, as the developer, you know that they don't understand anything that they're doing. They're always processing information, strings of, strings of bits, characters, but they don't know how to process knowledge. To give you an example, we have systems today which can access, search through all news articles that have ever been published and find just those that are about the recent earthquake in Haiti. Then we have semantic technologies that can read through those articles, pull out all the facts and figures and tell you what happened. They can tell you what Obama's reaction was to the earthquakes in Haiti. Well, that's kind of incredible. But I can't then turn around and ask my computer, hey, computer, how does that compare to other presidents' reactions to other natural crises? I can't say, would you please explain to me how foreign aid works? I can't brainstorm with my computer about creative ideas for how I could get involved and I could help. The problem is that while our computers can process the words of our news stories, they don't understand the meaning of these words. Our machines are only able to do the very specific tasks we assign them to. They lack a general purpose intelligence. They're very clever, but they lack common sense. So around the turn of the millennium, I took an unusual step. Um, I went back to school to study philosophy. Um, this struck many of my peers as crazy or, or just stupid. They said, you have a great technology career. Why would you go read all these difficult books about these esoteric subjects um, and get a headache doing it? Which, which is a fair point. I, I did get a headache often. But there's a reason why I did it. And that's because I wanted to understand the limitations of artificial intelligence. I want to understand what should we expect from our technology. And to do that, you have to stop the race of building the next clever little gadget. And you have to say, let's really reflect on human intelligence itself. The lure of philosophy is the unconditional pursuit of understanding of the human condition. To be a philosopher is to think hard about the hard problems, to think hard about thought itself, about what makes something meaningful, what makes our language meaningful, what makes our lives meaningful, and what is meaning anyway? Why are machines so poor at grasping it? Well, I've spent a lot of years now thinking about these questions, uh, earning my PhD, teaching at various universities, and it's completely changed how I think about technology and what technology is for. The key insight I want to share with you today is this. While technologies can take us further than ever before, we can do more with them than ever before, it is always humanity that generates meaning. Machines can sift through our words, but words are not meaningful on their own. Words have meaning because we speak them, because of the roles they play in our lives, because of the human concerns they implicate. <clears throat> Even the most advanced AI systems today essentially come down to pattern matching, matching against different symbols, but they don't know what those symbols mean. They don't know why we react differently to a story about earthquakes in Haiti and a story about vacations in Haiti. To a computer, all symbols are alike. <clears throat> this is why technology cannot answer all of our questions, and it's why I now believe that the primary goal for technology should not be replacing human intelligence, but rather facilitating human interaction. Uh, per the theme of the gathering today, this is the kind of interactivity that I'm interested in. 
So I'd like to tell you a little bit about a recent project I've been working on with this more human-centric approach to technology. Consider web search, immensely valuable and also really peculiar. You have some question in your head, and what you have to do is this. Turn that question into a few keywords, go find a web browser, find an internet connection, type in the keywords, sift through the results, try to extract bits of information. That's a very technology-centric kind of experience. <clears throat> If you think about it, it's really bizarre that today an entire generation believes the first thing you should do if you have a question is type keywords at a machine. It's as though we've forgotten that originally a question is an invitation to a human engagement. So what if, in addition to having billions of documents available on the web, we had billions of people available through the web all asking and answering questions with each other? The amount of information in people's heads positively dwarfs the amount of information online, even today. Just think, in your own case, of everything you know and how little of that you've published online. What if technology could help us harness all of that knowledge? So a few years, together, a few years ago, I got together with a few friends, and uh, we started a company and built a new kind of search engine. Um, it's a social search engine. It's called Aardvark, and it's very simple. You send Aardvark a question, and Aardvark's job is to find a person to answer that question. Aardvark will search through your social network, try to see if there's somebody online who knows about what you're asking about, and send you their response. It's very simple. It's driven by some very complicated technology on the back end. We use cutting-edge artificial intelligence to categorize your question, to index massive amounts of social graph data, to try to figure out what different people know about. AI systems are very good at that. But then it's a human being who hears your question and understands what you're looking for and sends you an answer. We use AI not to replace people, but rather to help connect people. The amazing thing is that it works so far. Uh, we've launched our site, Aardvark, and uh, only a few months ago, but already over 90% of the questions that people send to Aardvark get answered by somebody. And usually they get answered by somebody in under five minutes. Now that's very surprising. There you are with your problem in your dark corner, not sure what to do, and a few minutes later, you're connected to somebody who wants to help you. It's kind of engineered serendipity. Um, to, to give you a little color about uh, the kinds of things people are asking Aardvark, uh, here are a few questions. <clears throat> I stumbled across a copy of Labyrinth by Borges in a bookstore and was completely captivated by the writing. Which of his books should I read next? A, a clever machine might send you back a lot of books about, uh, by Borges, but what you want is a discussion about which book you would be interested in. Um, here's a different kind of question. I have a close friend who's been battling breast cancer for nine years and just had to move to a hospice. She'd love nothing more than to see the new Julia Child movie, but she's bedridden. Does anyone know if there's a way I can arrange a screening of the movie in her hospice room? Time is of the essence. Suffice it to say that typing cancer screening into a search engine is not what's called for here. We're not looking for information. We're looking for a human connection, somebody who can understand where we're coming from. Uh, and, and a product question here. I accidentally dropped my new MacBook Pro 15-inch screen into a large bin of chili. It was in there for about two minutes. What should I do? Um, ha ha happily, this one got an answer quickly, which explained how to salvage the chili. Um, so there are many, many more examples like this. Uh, if you're interested, you can see them on vark.com. But the much broader lesson I want to share today is just how valuable it can be to step outside of your technological worldview and consider the input from different disciplines. Philosophy is not a terribly popular subject among young people today, but I believe it should be. It's a very different kind of thinking than technological thinking. As a technologist, when we encounter problems, we try to solve them. That is, we try to get rid of them. As a philosopher, when we encounter problems, we're grateful. They show us that there's something wrong about our worldview. There's something we need to learn. There's a chance to become a little bit wiser. The insights we get from that are invaluable. Who knows what we'll build, build next? Um, I, I think I'm almost out of time, so let me say one final thing. I believe that as technologists, our efforts should be spent facilitating human interaction and not simulating human intelligence. Technology cannot solve all of our problems for us. The task of thinking is still ours. Thank you. Thank you.